to have a a rear a really uh, good uh, uh, talk uh, from uh, one of Ar Arecibo's own, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Padrina uh, Terra, who is a senior observatory scientist at the Arecibo Observatory, and uh, uh, you can read her. Uh, very interesting and very uh, prestigious uh, bio on the uh, email announcement. And I think we'll try to get started right away. Uh, the title of her talk is Forcing of the Upper Atmosphere from Coupling of the Troposphere During Extreme Weather Systems. So with that, uh, we'll let Petrina share the screen and, and, uh, and get started. So, Padrina, uh, please uh, go ahead and you can get started when you're ready there. Please, everybody, mute your mic also while uh, Padrina is giving the talk. Oh, I mute now. So, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. It, it's okay. coming through great. Okay. And uh, thank you, uh, Jean, for the introduction and, and just taking this video so it's easier for me because I have two screens here. And thank you also this app for the opportunity to, to present this talk and for everyone that's here today. And so I was asked to talk about facts. That's a project that was recently funded by NSF and it stands for, as Jean already said, for the forcing of the upper atmosphere for clumping of the troposphere into extreme weather systems. Uh, this is a collaborative proposal and involved uh, a team, the team members from AO, that's Cristiano, James, and me, and also involves Morris Cohen and some uh, of his, um, his students for Georgia Tech and as well as Julio Urbina from Penn State University. So to understand a little bit, give you a better idea why you are, uh, we start to think about this project. We go back for in the time to 2017 when we have a very extremely active uh, Atlantic hurricane season. We have uh, like 17 amid storms, 10 hurricanes, six storm, six major hurricanes and two of them strike Puerto Rico. And my Irma was on September 5. It didn't uh, reach the main island, but was uh, over Culebra Island on the east side of Puerto Rico archipelago. And we also had the heat of Maria that I think everyone heard about on September 20. And this, this season was really devastated, a lot of damage in converted in, in dollars, like $295 billion. And here, just to have an idea, I don't know now, uh, of the, the situation on the, the Caribbean region on, on this month of September, 2017, we have, let's come again to the beginning. So we can see here in the beginning of the month, we have the hurricane Irma, that was a major hurricane that skirted Puerto Rico main island. So right behind we have Jose also coming in, uh, but was a, a little far from the from Puerto Rico and keep spinning around the same area for a while. And we have finally Maria developing really fast and comes toward our island. So about Maria was one of the dead hurricanes in the US history. Here we have a, a satellite image when it was about to land fall in Puerto Rico. We also have the track of Maria uh, across the island. And here we have the also the track of the, the whole history of Maria. And what was very interesting and surprised was the, the really uh, quick intensification. And Maria was like in two days, it, it began, it starts as a tropical depression. It was already a major hurricane. So this was really impressive. The one was of the features that we, we observe in Maria. So Maria's eye had passed very close to, to an observatory on September 20. 
about 12 uh, uh, p.m. And here we had uh, uh, some uh, data that Phil put together from the weather station that we had on site. And we could see the huge amount of rain and the wind behavior when the, the eye was uh, passing a very short, uh, close to the, the Jerisib Observatory. So once this was all over, uh, the action was over, but the aftermath was really like complicated to the island. We should uh, all heard about that. And I personally was my first experience. So we start to think about, okay, we have this thing that just passed over us and it's a natural phenomenon. It's going to maybe happen again, or it's happening every year, not in, over Puerto Rico, but as you can see here, that tropical cyclone tracks for like, like from 8051, and that's involved a, 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 a wide area here in Puerto Rico. It's part of this, this sector where we are always uh, continually uh, getting these, these systems that travel from the, the coast of Africa towards the Caribbean, the, the US. So we, once of, one of the motivations of facts was the, the, our location. Our, we are in a very hot spot, strategic location to monitor it, to, to use these um, systems uh, to understand better the, the upper atmosphere response to these forces. And even if we, that was one of these um, first points when we, because we submitted this, this proposal uh, and was declined the first time. And we were trying to, to tell the reviews, look, even if the system is not over Puerto Rico, but the G systems, they are not, the, the effects of the systems or the upper atmosphere is not local. And it's, they are not also instantaneous that they just blink and go. They can also uh, actually reach a broad and extensive, extensive region around the cyclone itself. So another motivation besides the location was the, the cluster of instruments that we had at RSC when Colabra, but uh, already installed here. So here we have a list of the instruments that we have, the instruments are named here. We have the parameters that we can observe with these instruments. And we also have the altitude coverage that virtually we can say that it ranges from the ground to the thermosphere. And that's a mix of radio, optical, and that's a very important, uh, it's, it's, we say that's a key factor to, to, to study the atmospheric coupling when you can actually have multiple instruments with a, a, a broad um, activity, uh, altitude coverage to observing one um, period of time or one uh, event. So once that we uh, get around this uh, project thinking and motivated, we start to go back to the data that actually start to dig into the, the database to see if we have some data that we could have around uh, Maria's landfall in Puerto Rico. So we found some, and that we found out that actually the ionosome that we have here in Kaye was up and running during the before that was like Maria led from when so that was before during and after the hurricane Maria so we went behind the parameters here we have the the frequency on the peak and the, here the the altitude of the peak and we plot this and we compare it then with the same period by September 19 to 23 of uh, 2018. Because this period in 2018, we have the same uh, similar uh, geophysical conditions, but we didn't have any hurricane activity around this, these days. So 
we did the average of the 2018 data, the, the sorry, red lines. And if we show for the local time, and we uh, got the residual that was the data from 2017 minus the data of uh, 2018. And we did this for the frequency and also for the height of the F2 region. And we could observe fluctuations on these signals. And we start to think how to gather more information about that and we decided to go for a wavelet uh, spectrum analysis of these residuals. And we detect an enhancement of the, the periods of the fluctuations on both parameters. And this, this enhancement was before the, the landfall of Maria, during, and for the, the frequency, it stays actually after the the landfall but the same behavior was not like after the 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 landfall of maria the the period the disenhancement was not observed for the the height um, and here we did the same for the that's for 2017 we did the same analysis for 2018 and we actually uh, got it that's for just to better visualize, we got the, the ratio between these two years and we can see very clear that we have the period distance around 24, 12 and four hours. And we believe that these enhancements, at least these four hours here maybe are caused by the, the gravity waves. And so we, we said, okay, we got some uh, response of the, to this system. So we start to dig more database and we actually got some um, uh, data from the Airglow imager that we have here. And I'm sorry, I should put the move, but I got to doing what we have in the proposal and I forgot about. So when Maria was uh, almost like 900 kilometers Southeast was here a federative observatory, we had um, we detect some wave fronts coming propagating uh, all way from the source of the, the tropospheric source here, and uh, that means northwestward in three different air glow emissions that they come from different uh, heights of altitudes, and just to to to. Uh, be clear, like the, usually the MSGID is on the, the red line. We, they, they go the southwestward uh, direction and during Maria or pre-Maria, they were traveling northwestward. So we also look at for some clues of the, the atmospheric perturbations during Maria and the photometer and Fabi Perot data. So here on the left, we have some profiles of the brightness of the red line and green line emissions during the nights that were before Maria hit Puerto Rico. And we also have the points for the same period that this was uh, obtained from the red line Fabri Perot. Both were in, in, in Arecibo. So we did the same basic analysis. We got some uh, days uh, that were not during the tropospheric event and we got the residual of this brightness. And for the, the red line and green line, and here the, the dots are the photometer data and the, the cross the Fabri Perot data. And we kind of divide this in, before midnight and after midnight to, to avoid and masking for this behavior of the brightness here over Puerto Rico. And we identify a drop on the, the intensity of these lines for both emissions in both instruments. Actually, the, the, the red line, we have both instruments, the green line of the photometer. And the history behind this that we did first this analysis to the photometer. 
and both instruments, they have a, a narrow field of view compared with the our uh, sky image that I showed before. And we said, okay, that's real. We are kind of how so far from, from what I see, well, can you get at this kind of behavior? So we when we put together the Fabipero data and we observe also the, the drop on the intensity of the emission said, okay, so this is really happening and we need to investigate more the causes of this, this behavior. So we also have data running uh, from the VLF receiver that we have here in Arecibo. And Morris was uh, analyzing this data and he, he found out that when Maria was already passed Arecibo on 22nd, it was in that position northwestward of Arecibo, the receiver that the, we, the, the, we receives uh, a signal from the NEA uh, transmitter. And he was able to, to identify a, a long period of gravity wave uh, pertur pertur perturbing this signal. And he even got a, like a, a insert shows here that uh, was the signature of uh, acoustic gravity wave perturbation on the VLF signal. So, that was the that was the 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 data that we had that we at least we look into, and we also have some um, uh, studs preliminary studs that we have here, data from the GNSS receiver stations from Natalia Wolf that she had around Puerto Rico, and she detect a uh, 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 decreasing the MSGD's occurrence during the uh, hurricane season in 2017. So we also had uh, previous studies using data, uh, airglow data from our sky image installer in Culebra. And this is data is from 2015 to 2019, it's like 40 years of data. And we also were looking to this previous publication and we realized that the occurrence rate of these MSCIGs during the hurricane season decreased. And on this publication, we compared our data with previous publication and that was from Secret all 2011, and also Martins at all 2010, that are the dots and the red, the, sorry, the green cross. And we also can, could see the, 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 the decrease of the occurrence rate of the MSJGs. So this got us even more motivated to understand, to put a project together to understand better what are going on on, on, on the upper atmosphere when we have the approach of these extreme weather systems. So, one of the 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 oh sorry, one of the the our uh, questions marks what what more could we have if we had planned, because these uh, previous results they were not uh, from coordinator observations were just having this there without planning anything, and even like that we have signatures of Maria at different altitudes using different instruments. And we have this responses, the signatures uh, detected before Maria reached Puerto Rico, during Maria landfall and after the hurricane, after he left Puerto Rico. So uh, we put together the facts project that we, we went really to explore these this waves that are generated by these systems. And we had to enhance our knowledge on how these forces impact the, the upper atmosphere and the ionosphere thermosphere system. So we select some science drivers that I'm not going through each one of them in this uh, presentation because it's maybe we can have a later uh, discussion about cheese because that's involved with more, much more details. But basically, we want to to understand better the D region response and how it connects to the the response to the EWS activity, how it connects to the E and F regions, 
gravity waves and GIGs. We also want to understand better the influence of this EWS events on the parameters and occurrence of SGIGs. And finally, we also want to use this database to discuss, to, to contribute to discussion that, that is about the computer theories on the origin of MSGIGs. So for this, we proposed using a unified data sets relating the, the ionospheric response for the three ionospheric regions to this uh, input of energy from the stroposphere events. So, so one of the highlights of this project is the new data analysis techniques that uh, of mapping the region that Morris and his team developed. It's basically giving you a tomograph, tom tomographic view of the uh, electron density in the region that we know that the region is very hard to observe. And they developed a very nice uh, methodology to, to get in this region mapped. And this is going to, to be used on this project. So our um, instrumental uh, strategy, it's basically a, a center at AO and Culebra it's in Puerto Rico. And we are also using the Haye Yonoson that uh, is also operating and running. And we are proposing to put two more VLF receivers in the north northeast of Brazil to cover better this region of the Atlantic Ocean that we are not covered with the receivers that we have right now. We are also budget to build a, a dedicated uh, all sky imager to Culebra with a high resolution like observer one uh, emission to be able to get a more uh, resolution time of this wave propagating into our space. And the future, we also want to in, increase this uh, our sky imager, putting another one. We just select here one island for the Caribbean and also um, somewhere maybe in the in real wild that we are talked to then on, on Florida to uh, kind of complete this, this path around here, around the Caribbean. We are also uh, proposing to use saber data that to help us to characterize the, the mesospheric background and where these gravity waves can uh, are propagated and this way complement our uh, ground-based observations. So uh, here we, uh, before the show, uh, talking about these preliminary results, we we'll just, I want to say that we, one of the, the features of facts is not looking forward the new uh, hurricane seasons, but want also to dig into the database, the historical database that we have that's very important here at AO for decades. Some of the instruments have decades of data. So we start to do this, and here we have some preliminary results from the, the Fabri Perot red line emission. And we put together some data from 2014 to 2020. Here we can see all the, the valid points, it's about 300K points. Based on these, we build an empirical model uh, in function of the day of the year, universal time, solar floods, and our social magnetic index. And when we, we get the residual, that's the data minus the model, we Sorry, we can see that even the data is very dispersed. The, the comparison between the model and the data shows that slope is uh, uh, equal one, but means that the overall behavior of the, the, the both data and model are uh, in agreement. So we took uh, for the, the, all the hurricane systems, we, we didn't consider here to cause storms, but that's also something else that we want to include. We just, for this preliminary uh, analysis, we just include the hurricane seasons that occur in this period. And we, here, all these red plot, the red dots are the position of the hurricane's eye when the fabri data was available in this period. So based on that, 
we gather the, the, the dependencies of uh, latitude and longitude to this, of these residuals and also the, the best linear uh, regression approximated, approximation, sorry. So you use this information to build an empiric model again of the variability of this uh, green uh, red line emission uh, regarding to the position of the center of the AW system. And then we could map the, the, variation, the variability of the, the air glow emission for the red line in the sectors around Puerto Rico, that little one right here. And we identified that in this uh, path over here, we got it, uh, 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 the, this bright and uh, variating according to the position of the EWS system. That means that the position of the double EWS systems, they play an uh, important role on the brightness of the air glow emission. And we can notice that the, the major decrease or the major uh, variation in the emission occurred when the systems are in the southeast sector here of Puerto Rico. And that corroborates with the, our previous finding when we put together the Fabri Perot and the uh, photometer data. So that's just one of things that are going on right now. We, besides the optical uh, historical data, we are also digging into the radar data set from Arecibo and Culebra. And from the Georgia Tech site, Morris is also looking for the historical VLF data to, to see what more uh, clues we can find. We are working on the logistics for the installations of the VLF receivers in Brazil. Uh, we are also by parts uh, to build the OSK image that's going to be deployed in Culebra. We are recruiting undergraduate oops, and graduate students. These students are going to work with LF, Meteor Radar, Optical Database, and also one of them is responsible to, to, to organize a website where we, we want to have all these data are available and organized and so the the community can have access to that and also during the hurricane season what's going on and and this kind of things we are also recruiting a technician to support the project and that is a lot for the upcoming work i just put here some some items but the project is just starting so we are refining the vlf uh, automatic detections we are complete uh, all the data analysis for the all the instruments that we are uh, working on the project, and once that this is is done, we will compare our finds with meteorological conditions. So we were like our team uh, people are some PIs have contacted us to to ask her for the project, and they are also some people that want to collaborate with modeling or with new instruments. So we just want, I also want to take the, the opportunity to say that we welcome collaborations. We can, you can uh, also uh, add to our uh, data set, the many data that you may have during this period. And however, the, Due to the AO closeout plan that NSF announcement was a very surprise for all of us, we cannot invite uh, PIs to bring their equipment to AO. Uh, so because when we we got a GIS proposal approval, one of the plans were to have campaigns during the hurricane seasons where we could coordinate the observations with visitors uh, instruments, for example. But that's not going to be possible because NSF will, will not permit. So we, but we uh, would like to say that all the visitors' instruments are very welcome on the Colabra facility because, in case that the NSF does not allow us to operate the required instrument for these proposals during the transition period to the uh, new uh, XR center. We will concentrate on that by genes, I mean that we relocated them to Culebra. 
And I'm talking about the photometers, I'm talking about the spectrometer and the VLF receiver. So since I'm talking about collaborating some other time in day, I also was asking for some ASAP members to what was this facility. So just to give it an overview, and that collaborates a very small island. It's about 150 kilometers east for uh, AO. 70% of the island is a natural reserve. So we have very low light and RFI contamination, what is very good for optical and radar experiments. And the, the ROF was first deployed in on a central portion of the Colebra. And in 2018, when UCF took over the management of AO, we moved the, the, the facility to uh, another uh, uh, area. And since then, we are in continuous operations, expanding our cluster of optical and radio instrumentation. And one of the, the features of the facility is that we are uh, operated with solar system that backups all the, the, the instruments and also collecting data from the rain. So we have a very sustainable place. And also it's a very uh, particular, uh, a very good feature to be able to maintain operations during the hurricane season or after math, right after the, the any uh, system uh, hit us again. So here we have a map of Colebra Island and just to have an idea, today we have two main, two sites uh, that we are using for the ROF. We have the main site that's uh, close to Flamenco Beach, and we have another flat site that we are depl we deployed the, the Prisma, that's a project that's a meteor radar that we just deployed. It's like it's working uh, right now in this location. We didn't put them together here because the, the area that we had before was not flat and was going to give like more cost to, to install here. So we decided to go over a flat area to have the meteor radar installed. So here I have uh, some view of the main site. We have two containers, let me just stop. This is for the, what holds the electronics, the optical instruments, and this is the lodging container where we stay. We have two bedrooms, kitchen, so we can stay for campaigns, for maintenance, for any kind of experiment that requires us over there. Right now we have a red line from Reaper Hall, an our sky imager, real meter, a high frequency receiver from APL, uh, GPS receivers from University of Colorado. We also have receivers from UT Dallas. We have cloud sensor or weather station, and we are preparing this the place to receive the Colebra aerosol lighter. That's a project that's led by James, and that should be concluded sometime this summer. And here we have some aerial view from the site that you can see that's very recluded, isolated, and there is no light contamination. And I do not have uh, aerial view for the other side yet, but I put here just some views from the antennas of the meteor radar, the transmitter antenna. We also have a small container on site that holds the electronics. And the meteor radar is operating that so have data things from the last 24 hours. So we can see the flux, uh, the meteor flux, the height distribution and of the, the meteors that are approaching our atmosphere. And just want to finish saying that fact is only example that after the telescope collapse, they always still can be incredible value scientific research facility and lead to new science trust. So I would like to thank you. And if you have any questions or if you want to know more about the project, more details about how we are going to approach each uh, science driver, science question that you put on this, you let me know, let our team know, and you'll be our Pleasure to talk more about this. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Padrina. We all 
give you a, a big uh, virtual applause uh, for the, the the work there. Uh, also, uh, it looks like you need some more hurricanes, but we certainly hope <laughs> no, no, don't, no. <laughs> you don't get any hurricanes uh, coming across the island. So. I think we have a lot of, they, well, they don't need to cross uh, the island. They can be like going around the Caribbean, right. not reaching any island. That's going to be also okay, because even if they... So that was one of the concerns of the Hippies for this project. That's okay. So you have a hurricane over Puerto Rico. You are not going to observe anything. Well, maybe, but that doesn't mean that we don't see the signatures on the, the other uh, atmospheric regions when they are approaching. So that's why oh, we want to, we put all this data together to, to, to be able to, to say, look, it's not only when it's over Puerto Rico. Sure, when it's over, we are going to be concerned about a lot of other things, but it's even if it's, it's they, are, they, they are traveling from, from Africa, we are still able to do a lot of work. That's great. Yeah, I'm sure there's, there's going to be a lot of data <laughs> coming in the future. The other thing uh, is that your talk shows that there still is a lot of things going on at the AO, and there's a lot of equipment and and uh, things that are going on. And we we hope NSF and the powers to be <laughs> notice that there's a lot of science that still can be done at the AO uh, in this. Uh, interim period and ho hopefully uh, a period that the AO gets uh, uh, recovered. So uh, maybe you could stop sharing and we'll see if we have any questions and discussion. Okay. Any uh, questions or discussion from anybody? No I, questions. <laughs> I guess one is is uh, what what about the incoherent scatter? What what uh, was going on with that during the? Uh, we we know that the the line feed uh, broke off, but uh, was there any data from incoherent scatter that you looked at as well? Well, we didn't have the chance to go over that yet, but that's also the plan to include the historical data from the ISR. I I believe there was running some days uh, before Irma, but that uh, Cristiano is the one that's looking for this, this ISR data. So we still do not have, but certainly it's, we plan to, to go over that also to see if we have any more, not only uh, during Maria, but also uh, the, the decades before that we have other systems approaching Puerto Rico. I, I may add something there, Jim. We run one experiment before Irma, I think two or three days before Irma, and then we locked down the telescope and then we had one more experiment between Irma and Maria. So these are the data that I'm working right now. Okay, very good. Any other uh, questions and comments? Uh, maybe Mike Nolan wants to say a few words as well. Um, I've got a question, not, not so scientific, but uh, how, how long is, uh, are, is the project funded for and how much does it or did it depend on the uh, main the Arecibo Observatory itself, and and uh, how independent is it of the observatory? Okay, so the project is funded by, for three years. It started on August twenty two, and as I as I mentioned before, we are planning to use both sites, Arecibo and Culebra, because it's also very interesting since we have. Red lines from Ripero and Culebra and Arecibo, and we also have images in Culebra and Arecibo. We could do a nice work with the wave propagation between the two sites. And also, we have actually uh, GNSS receivers from uh, UT Dallas that they have this project from Fabiano Rodriguez that they can also work like on the propagation MSGIGs. 
and they are also collaborating with this project. So the plan, the initial plan was to use, and also plan is still to use both sides, but we are now not sure if a receivable is going still to be allowed to have any visitors or any equipment here during the transition and after the transition because we don't know who is taking over the new center. So we are still waiting next week, Roman from NSF is coming to visit Arecibo and Culebra. And I expect that by at least by the end of the month, we'll have a more clear uh, definition if we are allowed to, to keep the instruments here during the transition or if you need to take it out because I was contacted by some PIs are telling me that NSF are contacting them to remove the equipment from here. So we still not sure what's going to be, but for this project in particular, we need to do some arrangements, but we still can run it independently of the receive observatory, moving some of the equipment for to Culebra, like Morris is willing to move if necessary, we would like to stay. But if that's the last option, we will move uh, the photometers, the optical instruments, and uh, Morris receivers to, to Culebra. The meteorite is already in Culebra, so we have a repair also over there. But the ideal thing was to have more uh, details about the, how the waves propagation to have both sides. But if you don't, we can continue with the project just to, with Culebra side. I'm sorry that I don't have a more clear answer right now, but that's what we know, nothing. Can you say uh, uh, anything about the, these uh, visitors next week? And also, it, did you say that right now there's no visitors allowed to uh, uh, come on the Arecibo property? We, no, I, what I said that uh, uh, we are not allowed to receive any visitors equipment on site. Like if you, Jean, wants to install a new uh, uh, air glow imager here for to observe with us to add to, uh, for example, to this new, this upcoming hurricane season, I can have to ask it. Uh, NSF permission to do that, but we know that we, uh, other projects or, or other PIs whatever that said, no, you cannot bring any new instrument on site, visitor instrument on site now from like maybe weeks ago up to the new center is on place. That's what I said. We are receiving visitors, we are open, and but any instrument, a new instrument that wants to be placed on site, we need NSF uh, authorization. We okay. don't need to install them in Culebra, but we need to install them at RSC. We need NSF authorization. Okay, so, and what about the visit next week? What do you know about that? Well, we just know that Roman is coming to, and he requested to uh, get a, like tours on the optical lab, lighter lab, the how they say I see facility they are also talking about with us and he requests me to take him to collaborate to see the facility over there that's the information that i have okay and mike uh, nolan uh, yeah, uh, yes, yeah so uh, hi um i i think the asap would be very interested if you would be willing to write up some sort of description of what of how the science will be degraded um, by not having the Arecibo site, you said, I mean, you said you can get a lot of it from Culebra, but but oh yeah, sure. But, but if you could write us up a little description of like a couple paragraphs of what really is going to get lost by the fact that you don't have the two sites, I think that might be of value. Okay, I can do that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, one other question: Isn't there someone else coming from NSF? I think it might be an astronomy facilities person, sort of somewhat like Roman, maybe, but. Yeah, I heard. Yeah, I heard that also. We have a congress visit, right, with someone from NSF accompanying them. So that one, it's. I think it's going to happen on Monday. Someone from here can confirm. Cristiano, I think it's Monday, and Roma is arriving on site on Tuesday. So about this other visit, I just heard, but I don't know any details. Maybe Luisa. I don't know who more. 
could have more details about that. They are coming to win. They're what? Yeah, Monday. They are coming to win. It's Monday. Yeah, it's Monday. Yeah, but we don't know who of Congress is. No, so we don't. From NSF Press and the person you mentioned, and I don't know who else. So they are not, uh, uh, that that other visit was not announcement uh, for us. I, I know from Roman because he contacted the ACS group since he's from Geospace. So he wants to talk to us, but I have no idea about uh, what the, the reason for the visit, we don't know. Are they going to visit? Uh just certain people at the observatory or are they going to visit the, is it sort of like everybody at the observatory will be at these meetings? Roma from, from the geospace, it's only the ACS group. The other one that are coming with the Congress member, we don't know anything about, like the agenda, we don't know. I don't think that they are coming to talk to us. Okay, any other uh, comments or discussion, questions? Well, we thank you very much, uh, Padrina. It looks like there's no more questions and discussion. We hope, uh, hope those meetings uh, will give some more information and yeah. uh, please keep uh, ASAP informed uh, about it, of course. Um, so, uh, oh wait, there are some more here. Okay, uh, let's see. I think I think Anish had a, a, a he was a millisecond faster. Go ahead, Anish. No, I think it's he was just no. It was <laughs> just an up plus. Oh, sorry. okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> yep, I, 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 my it's my bad eyes here. So, <laughs> yeah. Thank thank you very much, Padrina. We all oh, you are welcome. That. Thank you for the very opportunity. good talk and. Uh, and uh, we hope to hear more. And, and yes, if you could write something up and get it to Mike uh, there, that, that would be great. Sure, I will. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, Padrina.